Our next speaker has promised not to throw in too many zingers, but uh, we'll hear next from someone who was at the school when Nishant was there and uh, uh, who will continue the narrative, but this time from the school's perspective. Please welcome the Associate Head of School from the Asheville School, Jay Bonner. I want to thank Lori and Damien and Steve, the other SIS staff members for their help in planning and preparing these words and images. Thank Chris for his shaping of our time and my remarks. And last but not least, I want to thank Nishant who gave me this opportunity today to join again in his journey and to continue a longstanding collaboration. The, the title that I've chosen for today's remarks is Back to the Future, a look at globalization through a school's lens. Schools are about journeys, are they not? Students journey through our curriculum, through all of our planned and unplanned events and activities, and our students undertake a journey in their minds, hearts, and souls while with us. The staple singer snippet you heard, and I didn't even know that the uh, community school was founded in 1970. This song came out in 1972. I'll Take You There is a call and response structure, not unlike certain past practices in our classes. More importantly, we try these days, as do the staple singers, to take our students to heavenly places, literal and metaphorical, they might, may, might not visit otherwise. Indeed, our students may choose to reside more fully in these places as a result of our curricular efforts. The journey, of course, is the oldest theme or trope in literature. Think of Exodus and the Odyssey and Gilgamesh. We are here this weekend to celebrate and to understand the journeys of our schools, those we have taken and those we imagine we might take journeys that have seen our schools move more fully into the world while also accepting the movement or influence of the world into our classrooms and hallways. This afternoon for the next few minutes, we'll travel back in time together before we return to the present and speculate when Chris talks with you after my remarks a bit more about the future. But first, I want to revisit the 1990s. On TV, we're able to watch such popular fare as Sabrina, Everybody Loves Raymond, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, South Park, and Third Rock from the Sun. Buffy proved a cult hit, and it was broadcast on a non-major television network as part of the burgeoning cable world a decade before The Sopranos, Mad Men, and House of Cards suggested the demise of major network television and even, dare I suggest, the movies. The musical decade began with Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit, but it ended with Britney Spears' release of Baby One More Time, with Hanson's Mbop. Academy Award films included Titanic and Goodwill Hunting. Remember? Here's what I remember. He hasn't aged a day, as he's told us, or really changed, has he? The goatee would give him demerits and restriction uh, in 1996. He emerged Athena-like from some god's head in India and has been the same intense, thoughtful, deliberate, reflective human being since the morning I first met him in an American literature class back in September 1996. I had entered the class to observe the teacher as part of my responsibilities as dean of faculty. Sitting amidst the students, I quickly became aware of this young man to my right who was answering or prepared to answer every question posed, in addition to asking thoughtful questions about the reading itself. 
When I debriefed the class with my colleague, I asked him, you will soon understand is entirely self-servingly, if the student might not benefit from the challenge of the honors level section which I taught, and my colleague agreed. Nishant entered my honors American Lit section as we were reading several Allen Ginsberg poems, including America and Hal, that in my mind at least reached back to the explicit and implicit promises of the Declaration and called the question on a fraying debate. If I remember correctly, and Nishant has confirmed that a paper was due in a day or two, and I just assumed, remember this is still early in my teaching career, Nishant would willingly and ably analyze the poem and hand me a fine paper. What I blissfully ignored was that the rest of the students had the benefit of class conversation about the poems. Nishant came into the analytical discussion at a later point. Our talk might have served as a better concrete and lived or experienced example of a non sequitur for Nishant than the illustrative examples found in the OED. What I also discovered is that Nishant possessed a fluency of verbal expression that at that time did not initially translate fully to the page. Thus began our odyssey together, an odyssey that sailed across an ocean of papers, a journey of exemplary work on Nishant's part. His final exam that year was one of the best I've read ever, demonstrating why the material mattered to him at a personal level. Here is, after all, a young man from India whose country's independence was inspired in part by Gandhi's reading of a little essay of Thoreau's Civil Disobedience. Nishant took to America's transcendentalists as if they were a branch of his family he had just met. Our work together his junior year led to an independent study his senior year, a course which Nishant proposed and developed almost entirely on his own. We read Emerson's essay and Thoreau's Walden, works by Fromm and Chomsky, novels by Huxley and Orwell, and a fascinating book by Dave Edwards, one of the most transformative books I have read as an adult, Burning All Illusions, about freeing ourselves from the illusions of freedom we use to soothe ourselves in democratic societies. It's both a soul-bearing and a soul-saving book. And here is Nishant engaged in this conversation with me in my office as he thinks about college and life, about meeting the expectations of his parents and of his own ambition. You've seen visual evidence just now that Nishant gave himself to other areas of school life, star of our drama stage in Let's Murder Marsha and The Swan Song, editor of our school's literary magazine, he was a school prefect, a position that meant Nishant served as a bridge between his peers and my colleagues in terms of his own behavior and in terms of addressing the behavior of his peers. We know the signs of intellectual curiosity in our classes. We see evidence of students who give of themselves to make our communities better places, serving as glue for the school values so they adhere in our students. All those external elements were entirely clear to me. They are gifts that so many international students offer our schools. I loved this young man who thirsted to explore intellectual paths alongside me, who sought to attain the deepest self-understandings. But did I thirst to understand Nishant? What was in Nishant's heart and soul? Listen. I read Nishant's journals. I worked with him in a classroom for a year and then for a year in my office, a journey of the mind and of his heart as it expressed itself in terms of qualities we all admire in our students. Persistence, courtesy, curiosity, integrity. What gifts he shared with all of us. But what did I know of his soul? What did I know about the affective world that enveloped him at meals and on dorm, at night and on weekends? What did I really know or push to know about his social self or his cultural self? What did students say to him when he arrived at school in those weeks before I ushered him into my class? What comments did he hear from my colleagues and from his peers about his vegetarian dietary needs during our seated meals? Did I tease Nishant inadvertently in a way that hurt? Was I insensitive to some hunger he had for family and culture that was thousands of miles away? And more broadly, do we institutionally address the holistic implications of bringing the world 
to our school communities. There's no question we get academic benefits, a host of benefits, Nishant in my classroom, Nishant on our stage, from the students who join us. Think of how Nishant modeled so many qualities we wish for our students. The taking of thoughtful risks as opposed to the adolescent engagement in risky behaviors. What is leaving home for a school thousands of miles away but a thoughtfully calculated risk? And for the qualities of diligence and curiosity, the list is endless. What do we give in return at our schools? Language immersion? a bridge to U.S. universities, and let's examine some data. As you can see, when Nishant arrived at Asheville School, international students comprised 10% of our student population, about 20 students. The West Indies, Korea, and Japan constituted the largest student cohort. Today, international students make up 20% of our student body at Asheville School, about 55 students which equals about 25% of our boarding population. Saudi Arabia and China have replaced the West Indies and Japan. We had no students from China in Nishant's years at Asheville School. Look at our enrollment data. The increase in international students accounts for about 45% of our enrollment growth since Nishant graduated and accounts, by the way, for a full boarding program. What we see at Asheville School is true of the boarding school data as well. According to figures from the Association of Boarding Schools, international student enrollment at boarding schools has doubled since the mid-1990s, back when Brittany was just a young, aspiring pop star. When Brittany was taking over the radio airwaves, China was not even a top 10 source for students in boarding schools. Now, China serves as the largest international source for boarding schools. On the BBC just yesterday morning, I heard that China was graduating a million college students a year in 2000. This year, the number is expected to be 7 million. Education is a big deal in China. The world does grow smaller. Families, Mary Pfeiffer reminds us, in the shelter for each other, are about love, relationships, and time. Good schools provide plentiful quantities of all three ingredients. May Congress and the White House work to remember those ingredients. If we invite the world into our school families, what are we doing purposefully to welcome the world into our school culture? It's probably akin at some deep level to thinking of the fraught transition between within a school with its history of single gender education becoming co-educational. What traditions do you maintain as essential to your school identity? And what cultural norms do we modify in sensitivity to our new school constituents? If we are thoughtful and deliberate, our school cultures and our school curriculums shape our students to function autonomously and collaboratively as part of the global family. Nishant has been part of the Asheville School family since his graduation in 1998. He and I have continued to talk about his education, brainstorm about his employment prospects, muse over opportunities, and address the pedagogy of classroom teaching and student understanding and its applications for faculty meetings in global symposiums. Maybe, just maybe, I lucked into an affective connection with Nishant after all because of relentless time, the time he spent to better himself as a student and human being, the time he gave me to serve him in his quest. In preparing these remarks for you today, I found a copy of my college recommendation for Nishant. I chuckled as I read my words because there was a Proustian moment, a memory of Nishant again as his teenage self, though I simultaneously had the memory of dinner with the married adult only two months earlier. In my recommendation, I had written, quote, 
Superlatives are depleted before description of him is complete. He is thoughtful, principled, articulate, witty, gracious, passionate. He is a young man who will be active in life for years to come, and I hope to be able to follow his certain successes." End quote. And I have. We have witnessed today his wit and passion and conviction his ability to articulate his thoughts and principles with grace and style. We are better people for the Nishants in our lives. Nishant's journey continues to intertwine with Asheville schools. Here's Nishant at the New Heads Conference a few months ago, alongside one of my former colleagues, Ed Maggart, who has started a headship at a school in Missouri, the same town where Nishant embarked to after he left Asheville School. The epic journey that has carried Nishant from India to North Carolina, from North Carolina to Missouri, from Missouri to Texas, from Texas to New York, from New York to Virginia, and from Virginia here to Atlanta, has been an active quest for the truth and beauty and promise inherent in our schools. See how much deeper and richer the promise's potential when the whole wide world joins into our quest. Thank you.